But are they really trying to mask the effect of, we just won't be able to grow enough animal feed. So how do you come out to a planet and tell them that with a straight face? Oh, by the way, the jet streams are shifting on a 400 year cycle. We didn't tell you about, you could have got ready 20 years ago, but we just won't be able to grow enough animals because literally there won't be enough animal feed for them. So we're gonna have to reduce the number of herds to keep up and equal the down steps each year with the uh, lost grain crops, specifically for animal feeds. You know, that's a hard sell for a lot of people. So if you swing the pendulum over and lump that under global warming, it gives a perfect excuse why there needs to be less meat, why there is less meat. Ask yourself, why is there less meat? Welcome to the Health Ranger Report on Brighttown.tv. Today, our guest is David Dubine from ADAPT2030, the expert in food crops and food production, crop yields, all that kind of thing, and also weather systems and how it affects food. And of course, the warning today, as you might imagine, given all the drought that's going on and the, the crop yields plunging, the warning is that the worst is yet to come in terms of food scarcity and food pricing. Uh, food selection is going to be greatly diminished in the months and years ahead based on what we're seeing right now in terms of the destruction of wheat crops, corn, soy, millet, oats, uh, alfalfa, you name it. It's not looking good right now. Uh, weather systems have been controlled. There's a lot of geoengineering. There's a lot of, of devastation of food crops, not only in North America, but also in other regions of the world. Why we're headed into food scarcity and food inflation. And he's got a lot of updates for us here. Welcome to the show, David. It's great to have you on. As always, it's been a little too long, so I'm glad to have you on today. Yeah, thanks for having me back. You know, and when you introduce like that, it's just so much to talk about. There's so many things, a tidal wave of different effects that we've seen. It's just really hard to even pick a point to choose to start the conversation because uh, you can see it's just vast and all encompassing right now, these disturbances that we see geopolitically, economically, and then we bring it down into the food production, then the weather systems. Well, is there anything that's, is there any good news? Are, are, are there any reports of food crop yields that are awesome and, and, and the weather's just right and, the, you know, record harvest? Because uh, I'm not hearing any of that, but are you hearing any of that? Well, there, there has to be specific microclimates that are reflecting that, but as an overall yield for the entire planet in terms of corn or wheat or whatnot, don't, I don't see that. I just uh, received the new USDA carryover stock report. And how much do you think in, in terms of millions of metric tons of carryover stock there are for the entire wheat crop for the United States from 2022 to 2023. Just give me a guess on how many million metric tons do you think are in the silos waiting just for an emergency in case we need it right now? Well, I can tell you what I think there should be. I mean, there should be 40 to 50 million, but I, I imagine there's, there's not. <laughs> Zero. Oh, gosh. Okay. That's, there's actually two that's dashes not good. there where there should be numbers, and I'm shocked. And then they show next year it's going to be something like 600 million uh, bushels coming in are, are going to go from zero to 600 million. But when you look at uh, the U.S. wheat associates, when they're forecasting out for their sales and exports out, it shows even leaner or less wheat exports and sales than this year. So I'm looking at these numbers saying, well, there has to be uh, something is disconnected here. When they're showing a zero carryover stock for U.S. wheat in total, and then next year it's showing even less for the sales availability, then that means this year's wheat harvest is down, and there's some non-communication of really how far down the, the wheat crop's going to be in terms of harvest. There's cheaper and more effective ways than Botox and microneedling to help turn back time. For instance, one of the best ways to ensure your skin stays as healthy looking and youthful as possible has everything to do with your collagen production. The brand I use comes with 10 grams per serving of supercharged collagen to support skin health. Every order using the link in the description box below comes along with several free gifts and 53% off your order. Go to healthwithadapt2030.com or click on that link in the description box below. That's healthwithadapt2030.com. And now on with the video. It's been in that drought zone for so long now. So. Well, right, and and I'm also reading, of course, uh, corn yields are horribly devastated across the Midwest, in particular, 
uh, because of, of drought. And just conditions in places like Missouri are just off the charts atrocious. I think as much as 80% of the corn crop has been destroyed uh, in Missouri, at least, or not, maybe not entirely destroyed, but at least partially destroyed, like not, not in good condition, let's say. Uh, what numbers are you seeing for corn and soy and alfalfa and things like that? Still getting around 70% in the drought affected areas of the total corn grown in the United States, 70% of it or 63 to 70% somewhere in there is in drought still. And that reflects the soybean crop also. And you need to add in the damage from the derecho, that sideline wind event that stretched halfway across the United States from north to south from the Canadian border, which included parts of Canada all the way down into say the panhandle of Texas and that sweeping wind at 100 miles an hour you know, some of those crops did rebound, but a lot of them did not. You know, we had our, we lost some of our corn here a couple storms ago. And it's just, even though I, you know, tried to put a mound of dirt around it and bring it back upright again, it just slumped right back over. You know, once you damage plants and you break that cellular structure in their stalks, they just don't come back. I don't care how much you try to. It's, nature is the way it is. When something's broken far enough, it just cuts the loss. And I, I think we're seeing a lot of that. Now, how's that going to be explained away, though, is more the question and, or used as a fear point? Well, well, exactly. But I, I want to ask you about grocery store prices, the impacts here, because, of course, people have already experienced horrendous food inflation over the last two years. And from what you're saying right now, it seems like that food inflation is going to get even worse. And maybe maybe inflation is not the right word because that, that that's a monetary word. And there is monetary you know, debasement of the dollar happening at the same time. But we're talking about scarcity of the food supply leading to price increases. So what can we expect to see over the next six months in the grocery stores? More of the same, but probably less choice as well. So when you start to look at the overall impact of things happening across the planet, especially in the geopolitic arena, you know, the availability of foods from certain regions that will not be exported, uh, it's going to have an effect. So think about Turkey, for example. So anything that was a Turkish-based food is probably not going to make its way to the States anymore. And you might go, well, big whoop, that's at a sort of an ethnic supermarket, whatever. But then you look at the, the cutting off of all the uh, rice coming out of India, non-Basmati, and then you go, well, look, if, even if you wanted to go to an Indian supermarket or even some of these Asian supermarkets or whatnot, there's rice isn't there. You saw those people fighting for rice in Costco. Yeah. So it's just the amount of, of availability of products that are going to be on our store shelves. And I wonder how they're going to do it in addition to what they've done already, because I know some people who are into uh, the fast moving goods arena, FMOC, and they were saying that what they're doing is shrinking the actual length of the aisles themselves to make it still if you're appear full. But if you're going to subtract five feet off the end of each aisle, then you, you subtracted a complete one or two aisles out of the entire supermarket. And that's why I encourage everybody to look on the floor because you can't mask that because when they're originally set in place, they usually have to drill into the tiles. You know, you don't want any lawsuits of things tipping over. So look for that as an indication on either side of the aisles if they've been shrunken to try to make it appear that things are just as full as they were. But when you look at that in a percentage basis, well, maybe not. Prices up and less availability of the foods moving forward would be my best guess on that. So the typical American consumer right now is pressed on uh, the fact that a larger percentage of their disposable income is going to food right now, but yeah. also a larger percentage is going to rent. So rent is still very high and going up in most areas. Things are becoming unaffordable. A lot of consumer goods, the prices are just insanely through the roof but i think in food it's it's the acceleration of the price increases is higher than in any other area we are also being told that there are efforts or we're seeing these efforts by governments around the world to try to suppress meat production and animal product production and uh, david my question to you is with the the shutting down of farms in europe and the attacks on farming in the United States and, you know, regulatory attacks, EPA attacks and so on. Aren't we also going to see animal derived products facing, you know, even more scarcity and heightened prices compared to vegetables and fruits and so on? Yeah, I want, I want to, I'll take that in two different directions with you as well. So to address that first point there, 
Absolutely. You know, you think about the scarcity of meats, but you also need to think about quality in the meats. So on my radio program that we were talking about as well is we think the next big phase is going to be mRNA free meats because look through the last 10, 15 years, people are seeking out antibiotic, anti-hormone, no hormone in the meat. But go to the crops as the main thing. Now, I'm going to be a world government. Now, walk with me through the mind exercise here of being a world government. You understand these changes are in and our jet streams are moving because of effects and changes electromagnetically from our sun, from the star, that big yellow thing over there to the left. That's changing on at least a 400-year cycle, many say a 2,000-year cycle. Now, what that's really affecting, if you look at the different maps of where crops are grown across the planet, not all of everything grown is food. There's a huge percentage that is for animal feed and for ethanol production. Now, if you start to look at those areas, you see a predominant number of them at 40 degrees north and above. That would include Canada, parts of the northern United States, uh, northern China, all of the southern part of Australia. And you start to look at the feed availability for the animals. Now, they might say one thing out of the side of their face over here, oh, we need to eat less meat, there's more CO2, there's more methane, blah, blah, blah. But are they really trying to mask the effect of, we just won't be able to grow enough animal feed. So how do you come out to a planet and tell them that with a straight face? Oh, by the way, the jet streams are shifting on a 400-year cycle we didn't tell you about. You could have got ready 20 years ago, but we just won't be able to grow enough animals because literally there won't be enough animal feed for them. So we're going to have to reduce the number of herds to keep up and equal the down steps each year with the uh, lost grain crops, specifically for animal feeds. You know, that's a hard sell for a lot of people. So if you swing the pendulum over and lump that under global warming, it gives a perfect excuse why there needs to be less meat, why there is less meat. Ask yourself, why is there less meat? You know, just take Ukraine as a perfect example. They're going to lose at least 50% of their field production this year. That's a best estimate. That's like a rosy USDA figure that they're going to be able to get 50% field production. I'm like, no way, maybe 8%, 10%. Right. But just that alone, on mainly they're an animal feed exporter. So just even if you were to take Ukraine completely off the world market, somewhere animals are going to have to decrease in number because that amount of feed coming from that country won't be able to satiate the need to keep those animals alive. And this is where we get into this huge, you know, just run around and word sauce here. And, I, you know, there needs to be you're going to have to know where your farmers are. Anybody out there, truly, you're going to need to know where your food source comes from. Make friends with those farmers. Buy the meat locally. You can no longer rely on supermarkets for your deliveries. Yeah, that, that's a key point. We've encouraged that too. community supported agriculture, knowing your neighbors. Maybe you have neighbors who are who have cows. And uh, I, I do. I, I mean, not not right next door, but a friend who uh slaughtered a cow and well actually a steer in this case and uh, and i went in on them with that so i got part of a steer in the freezer and i know that 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 steer was not injected with mrna as you said but you know there's been a a lot of concern about the fact that the usda under its organic certification program and the national organic standards board the nosb currently does allow mRNA injections and genetically engineered vaccines into animals that are considered organic. That is currently allowed. And it's horrifying to a lot of people. You know, Organic Eye put out a report on that recently and the ANH uh, USA did a report. I talked about it. I know you have. When we think about organic products, uh, animal derived products, milk and meat and cheese, you would think that they wouldn't allow mRNA injections but they do. And so doesn't that mean that we can't even trust organic alone? I mean, that's exactly what it means. The USD, so you are yeah, solely right. responsible for your food source. Please understand that. You know, a lot of people want to slough it off. Government will take care of me. Supermarket will take care of me. We are so far past that stage now that if you are not getting ready for a pioneering lifestyle, seeing the systems break down like they are in real time in front of you everywhere across the planet, you're going to have to take more responsibility for your own actions and to keep your family safe. There's no way around this any longer. I mean, I've been speaking at this for years about the changes in the sun are changing the jet streams to the point we won't be able to grow enough food on the planet. And for, you know, these world leaders to come out and try to, you know, pull different uh, parts of our food system down on purpose, but then to contaminate it 
yeah. when we need it most. That's non-human right there. And for all these excuses coming out, why there's not enough animals, oh, there's this CO2, that, now they want to dim the sun. And Mike, I heard you talking about that on the program. But we are really going to start to need to take responsibility for our own intake of our food, our production of food, the community understanding of where your foods are. And again, I'll take half a steer. I'll take half a carcass with you. I'll take a quarter. And, you know, if you get four people together, you can buy a steer. It's going to be a little much for all the freezers for one person. You know, those animals weigh 1,200 pounds. And save, save the organ meat for your dogs. That's incredible. Oh helpful. yeah, no, I, I have. Nothing should go. I wasted. request all the all the chewable bones and everything for my dogs. So you know, we get all the bones and organ meats and everything. Uh, you know, the bones have. I mean, we we don't waste the animal. That's for sure. You know, an animal died so that we can live, so that we can eat, and and you know, we do honor that that relationship. But I don't trust the factory farms. The you know the the, the factory cow. You know, confined cattle operations. The CAFOs. And it's interesting how it dovetails right into this transition phase of the sun's magnetic fields changing enough now to bend the jet streams and cloud cells. And then after that Hunga Tonga eruption with 10% more moisture, and actually they've come out with some new numbers since I first did all those reports because they agreed on was 10% more moisture. Now it's up to 14% more moisture in the atmosphere. Really? Yeah. Wow. So you have to think about how that is going to morph weather patterns too, because I just really try to put it in the simplest of terms. If you're draw, driving your car through a foggy night in a, you know, at the bottom of a valley somewhere, how dense that air is when you're driving through the fog compared to driving through a very cool night in the middle of the desert. Like the density of the air is going to move at different velocities or different speeds and it's going to create drag in some areas. And I think that's why we're seeing all these record floods across the planet right now. Is the, the, the jet streams have moved enough and the cloud cells are now combining on each other with all this extra moisture and it just hasn't really found its flow in the atmosphere yet. It will, but it's going to take a little bit of time, you know, like a decade or more. And luckily each year the, this water starts to, you know, this water that was injected up, it's going to begin coming out of the atmosphere, but some you know, edges of the, of the classroom over here will say, oh, it's going to stay up there forever. And others are saying, no, it's going to rain out after three to five years as it normally would for ash coming down from a volcanic eruption. So either of those, you know, we're still looking at a multi-year event here of disrupted ecosystems, food production, and what you consider as weather stability is going to greatly change. I mean, the amplification, if you haven't seen it, I'm sorry, you just haven't gone outside or been paying attention, at yeah. least in my opinion. No, you're, you're exactly right. I'm, I'm glad you're addressing these points because on one hand, we, we have all these weather weapons and geoengineering weapons and crop weapons. On the other hand, there's this unknown factor of what happens from these mad science experiments that governments are conducting on the world. But what we do know for sure is that the lack of stability, the, you know, the predictability in weather patterns and rainfall and so on, the lack of stability is what devastates crops. So the globalists, they don't need to really even know what's going to happen as long as they know it's chaotic, right? If, if, if they can just create, you know, temperature chaos or rainfall chaos, then they know they're going to achieve the famine they want to achieve. Now in Kansas tonight, and what's today, the 15th, they're going to be approaching some record lows uh, uh, of in, into the 50s and possibly high 40s tonight. So down through what we consider our grain growing areas, they're going to be at, at that very edge of hitting record low temperatures since the 1800s. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. So that was something that just came across a news feed because I try to go through Twitter and, you know, look for different temperature. I, I knew there was going to be something strange. You know, a lot of people were talking about the year without a summer after the Tunga eruption, including myself, and I was like, well, we're on the opposite side of it. We're in a different hemisphere. Uh, that was a water vapor eruption, not an ash eruption, but it was ash in, you know, so you're getting a, a double layering of different, you know, ty types of particulates up there. So I was considering like, you know, the summer of strangeness or weather discombobulation is more of a better point to it, where it was really cold in the Northeast coming into the summer. And now it's really hot in some places, but now it's going ultra cold. And then, you know, it's this flip-flop between the systems. 